Tonight's theme is leadership by faith. I've been thinking about leadership lately, <clears throat> thinking about our church and the leadership in our church, and that includes me. I've been reading Nehemiah and our devotions and thinking about his leadership. And in the last chapter of, of Nehemiah, which we read today, it was pretty interesting. This guy had such a heart for the temple of God and for the people uh, of Israel. Um, they had gone in a complete circle, and he was wanting to rebuild the temple that uh, God destroyed through Babylon. But almost immediately as they're building this temple, reestablishing the priests, the scribes, even the worship singers, and putting everything in order, they already started neglecting it. The priests weren't getting paid. Uh, people were being neglected. They were the, Some of the scribes and even the singers were going back to farming. And so all of a sudden the temple was being neglected again. Uh, they started marrying uh, unbelievers, getting becoming unequally yoked, uh, bringing in and worshiping the idols it, almost, almost immediately. Kind of strange that they didn't learn their lesson after 70 years. But it was interesting how Nehemiah... I got all the people together, all the priests, all the scribes, uh, all the musicians, and he told them, what are you guys doing? Why are you doing this? We just came out of captivity. We're now rebuilding the temple, and you want to go back? Don't you remember what you went through? And then it says that he literally grabbed them by the hair and yanked some hair out of their head. He slapped a couple across the head. Uh, he literally did that. And I was, we were laughing because it's like, wow, try doing that today as leadership of the body of Christ. People will leave the church like that, you know, plus lawsuits. And, and I was thinking about that all day, uh, you know, because Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, that uh, you're to be subject to those who rule over you in the church because they watch out for your souls. That's scriptural. They care for you. <clears throat> they don't slap you and pull your hair out, but <laughs> but we were thinking maybe that's needed. I don't know <laughs> in the body of Christ, you know. But I really started thinking and thinking that's how Moses got in trouble, right? <clears throat> because he misrepresented uh, God to the people. He got angry, and our God isn't angry. Uh, he loves every single one of us so much. Uh, he gave his son to die on the cross. Even my trip to South Sudan, willing to die, but God reminded me that he already died. He already suffered on the cross for me. There's no need for that to take place. So good leadership is one that has a heart, has a heart for uh, the things of God, but he walks by faith and not by sight. Nehemiah went a little too far. Paul is clear you to be obedient to those who rule over you but not everybody wants to be obedient to those who rule over you and so you have to be a, a leader that, that leads by faith and so you work with those that want to follow and those that don't want to follow won't follow you can't do anything about it and you just let them do whatever it is that they're doing and you lead the ones that want to come alongside you and help in the ministry Abraham was a was a man of faith and we're going to see here in a moment that the land will be divided between him and Lot. Lot will have to move on. His camp has just overgrown the area along with other tr uh, tribes and nations and of course Abraham's and so Abraham gives him the choice and he decides to to leave and Abraham then chooses whatever Lot didn't choose because he's a man of faith. He's not going to force his way. Sorry, sorry, Lot, I'm taking this area. You'd get the rest. No, he just says, well, go ahead, Lot. You take it, whatever you want, and I'm going to trust in God, and God's going to lead me. And, of course, we see in 14 through 18 that God leads him to the land of Canaan there, exactly where he is supposed to be. So in verses 1 through 5, we have Abram and Lot returning, returning right to the point where they built that altar and worshiped the Lord before they went down to Egypt. So they're returning right there. But this time they have great riches with them because God turned around what Abram meant to deceive Pharaoh with and he blessed him. 
He blessed him. Doesn't mean that we should deceive to get blessed. You know, but lo the Lord is that way. He is so gracious to us and he blessed him because he was a man of faith. <clears throat> so verse one through five, let's read that. Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also who went with Abram had flock, herds, and tents. So Abram is right back where he started he, he went in a complete circle boom he went up to Egypt or from Egypt him and his wife and all that he had with Lot with him to the south uh, the original Hebrew text here gives the sense that Abraham traveled like in stages <clears throat> because he was a man of faith but yet he wasn't quite sure what was happening that, that definitely is a ministry you have to be a man of faith your leadership has to be a faith, but we just don't know what the Lord is doing. Um, if we could figure out what the Lord is doing, then, um, you know, things would be totally different. But the Lord doesn't lead that way. He's never led that way. He's always led by faith. He wants you not to walk by sight, but by faith, trusting in Him. Philip, I want you just to go. He didn't say, Philip, I want you to go here, 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 meet an Ethiopian eunuch, and I want you to witness to him, and then baptize him. He didn't say all that. He just said, go just go <clears throat> Peter you're going to deny me but he didn't give him all the details you know you're just going to deny me so God has always done that with his people because he wants his people to be people of faith and once in a while we get off track we move very slowly we're trying to decipher whether God's leading this way or is he leading another way how do I know Lord and we receive scriptures and confirmation but then the lord does something totally different and so really I, I think it's correct and and wise to say the lord if the lord is willing if the lord is willing we'll go there if the lord is willing he'll do this it's all up to the lord and really we want to be in the lord's perfect will but he went around in circles he's going around in circles when he did not obey the Lord, he went from Egypt and now as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been in the beginning between Bethel and Ai, right there where the altar is. Uh, chapter 12, verse 8 through 9 said, he moved to the mountain east of Bethel and he pitched his tent there in Bethel, which means house of God. And on the west of Ai, on the east, there he built that altar to the Lord and called, the name, and called on the name of the Lord before he was interrupted by Egypt. That's where he worshiped, uh, where he gave and offered up sacrifice and had that communion with God as prescribed in the, uh, in the Old Testament. Um, and, and he probably sought direction, but all of a sudden something moved him to Egypt. And he went to Egypt and it got him in trouble. And so then God took that and worked it out for good and brought him right back to the altar. And so he builds this altar in Bethel between the two pagan cities where he could have easily freely express his gratitude and adoration to the lord once again because god was there even in the midst of all the struggle and, and trials of possibly losing his life losing his wife and losing everything that god had promised to him all of a sudden he's there at the altar and he needed to experience that same experience that he had earlier with the lord you know that first experience when, when you got saved and and things are exciting and the Lord's moving and you're walking by faith and you just have this trust and you know skipping your walk because you know that God's in total control but life seems to take us in circles and we allow things to take place in our lives that, that pull us further and further away from the joy of the Lord but Abram wants to go back to that altar and he wants to freely worship the Lord he wants to truly repent of the things that he had done <clears throat> remember what revelation 2 5 says remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works and that's what abraham wanted to do he wanted to come right back to that place that altar and he just wants to do those first works again that he had with the lord and jesus told that to the church in ephesus 
a group of believers who had strayed from their personal relationship with him, their passion and their love. And God has this permissive will and he has this perfect will for our lives. And when we go our way, which is always the harder way, the Lord has a way of teaching us lessons in those ways. Now you can, you can almost imagine what Abraham might have felt while he was in Egypt, knowing that his wife is there in the harem of Pharaoh and he's outside in a camp. Just think of, of what you would be doing as a husband or as a wife while well, you're in the harem with all these other women and you're just like, what am I doing here? What is he doing out there? And he told me to say that I'm his half-sister and I'm here because of him, you know? But she was obedient to him. And he's out there going, what did I do? What did I get myself into? What did I get her into? What harm's going to happen and so forth? And it's always harder to go your own way. It's like a liar. You know, a person who lies, it's hard to remember the lies that you told. And so you've got to keep telling more lies. And the more you lie, the more you forget, and eventually you spill the beans. And people know, you're lying. It's very simple, you're lying. But if you tell the truth, if you tell the truth, then you don't have anything to worry about because the truth is the truth. And you only know the truth, and so when you are asked again, you say the same thing because it is the truth, and you know it to be the truth. But a person who kind of skips and, um, um, ha, oh, mm, mm, oh, um, you know, when I, oh, uh, Oh, you know what? No, this is what really happened. You know? Then it's like, oh, wow. It's always harder to be a liar than to tell the truth. But we lie because we want to protect ourselves. We want to be something that we're not. It's harder to go our own way. Uh, Paul was going his own way and he was persecuting the church and God had to blind him and he says, why are you kicking against the goad, Paul? And that's that cattle prod, you know, that you, you poke. At that time, it was probably a, a, a stick with a sharp end on it. And you have a bunch of cattle, and you just you poke at it. And if you can get one cattle to move, he'll move the rest of the cattle. And he's saying, Paul, you're kicking against it. It's like, I'm poking you, but you keep coming at me to get poked. That's a hard place to be at. But we're consistent in that because we want to go our own way. And the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but that's the way that leads to death. Uh, Abram was that close to death, him and his wife. But Lord has a way of teaching us lessons, at least today, <clears throat> under grace. God is so gracious and so loving. I love that last song, Amazing Grace. Save a wretch like me. I, I, I never forget that I'm a wretch, that I am a sinner, and I fall short of God's glory. And I still sin. And the older I get, the more I realize I sin even more. And some of those things that, um, that you don't even think about, even in sin that you don't even know of. Because the closer you get to God, the holier He is, you realize, you realize the dirtier that you are and the more that you have a need for Him. And so you're appreciative of his grace and his mercies and so like the prodigal son who could come back very easily to the father and the father opens up his arms and receives him and throws a party so we too can do that come back to the father's arms he'll bring us around in circles and we'll be right there again as many times as it needs to be before we learn our lessons Abram left Egypt a rich man though very rich in livestock, silver and gold. And the Arabs at that time, the sheiks, considered to be rich, uh, would usually have 100 or 200 tents with 60 to 100 camels and thousands of sheep and goats, respectively. And yet they said that Abraham was even more richer than the sheiks, having gold and silver, which was very rare at that time, and yet he had gold and silver that was given to him by Pharaoh. You have to wonder, you really have to wonder if the whole experience could have influenced Lot, as we'll see at the end of the chapter. All of this wealth all of a sudden that Abraham gets and Lot all of a sudden gets, that, that could it have been a seed planted in him? It was like, wow, we got a lot of wealth from Egypt. 
There are wealthy cities out there. And if we invest in them, if we can somehow connect to them, if somehow we can manipulate them, then maybe we can become wealthy people. You have to wonder that because Lot's, we'll see, begins to grow, and he wants to grow even more. So he moves down to Sodom and Gomorrah hoping to have the good life. And I'm wondering if it made him yearn for the good life for this world. <clears throat> you remember the story later on um, down the road where the angels come and they ask Lot to leave with his family and they all leave. And as they're leaving, God begins to bring judgment, brimstone and fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And the one person who longed even more than Lot was his wife because it says she turned around and looked and she became a pillar of salt because we long for the, for the world, the good life, the, the things that we see in Sodom and Gomorrah. And there are repercussions for our actions, aren't there? There really are. Now, we might not think so because we're the exception to the rule. We might not think that God's going to be judgmental he's going to be gracious and we hope that he's going to be gracious but you know if you put your hand in the fire and you get burnt more than likely there will be blisters you'll get boils there'll be fluid that has to be drained that's the repercussions will will mommy love you again of course she will of course dad will forgive you uh, they may correct you and they may discipline you but you have to suffer the boils the emergency room, the wrappings and so forth, you know, you're going to have to suffer all of that. So there are repercussions for the things that we do. And Abraham may have been suffering those repercussions through his nephew Lot there. It was here though that Abraham once again began to worship the Lord and he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord once again. He felt that strong desire to renew his faith on the scene of his former worship. What do you think that Abraham said at that moment there in Bethel do you think he said look at what a faithful servant I've been Lord you think he said that to the Lord I don't think so I don't think he said that at all I think as you looked at that altar it was probably wet with tears and blood as he wept and cried upon the altar as he offered up a sacrifice for the sin of to atone for his life and his family. I think Abraham called on the name of the Lord that day as a convicted sinner. And he was in a place of repentance. And as a sinner who knew that there was a sacrifice for sin, and he expressed his humility and his repentance for his misconduct there in Egypt with thankfulness and grace and mercy that the Lord had delivered him. This should have been an example to Lot, but apparently Lot didn't catch it, the repentance of Egypt, the world. See, when you fall, you can be like Abraham. You can learn from your experience, and that's what we're supposed to do is learn from our exper experiences, you know, to not make the same mistakes. I like going to, to meetings with my peers because they'll tell stories of things that have happened in their churches. And you go, okay, I, I want to be careful not to let that happen in my church. And you learn through their experiences. It's good to fellowship with one another as women and as men because then you learn from each other's experiences. You know, and being a good husband, being a good wife, being good children as you gather together for the youth ministry and so forth. Experience teaches, doesn't it? It teaches us, and it should cause us to draw closer to the Lord and learn something great. And that's really uh, wisdom because that's knowledge, experience, the knowledge applied to our lives that will not go down that path anymore. A child has to only put his hand once into the fire, and from that point, he probably will not put his hand in the fire any longer. Hopefully, he learns his lesson. And, of course, this brings us to the dilemma of Lot and what he does now. One commentator said this, Abraham and Lot feared God. They were related and fellow travelers. Poverty, hunger, toilsome, journeys to and from could not bring about any strife. 
but the abundance of temporal possessions had nearly accomplished it. When Abram saw the mark of the cunning of the devil, if this could have happened to holy men like these, we may easily see how far Satan can carry those whose hearts cling to worldly goods. <clears throat> His point is, is here you have relatives, friends who've been through life thick and thin, but it's possessions, it's the world that can bring division inside of them, just like within the church. Uh, maybe your relationship with the Lord was great for the first five years, and, and maybe things were really happening spiritually for months ago. Uh, Jesus' words to you would be the same as it is to the church of Ephesus. Remember, remember where you came from. Repent and turn back to those first loves. Stop what you're doing and get into that relationship, the house of God, communion with the Lord, and just do those first works and let God handle everything else. And He has a way of rekindling that fire. He can rekindle love in your heart for Him and for those around you. Abraham went back to where it all began, where he had pitched his tent previously, where he had built the altar initially and he worships the Lord, a broken man. Then we come to verses 6 through 7, and we see this contention with Lot arise. Let's read 6 through 7. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. Now he mentions that because they were there in the land of Canaan, which later on we'll see uh, they're going to be asked to destroy them and remove them from the land that God had promised to them. But they're there and they have livestock. Uh, they're feeding off the land, grazing and so forth. Their camps are also growing and they're being, being in a sense pushed out of the way for, with Abraham and Lot. And so this dilemma that is taking place there it doesn't say that they got upset at each other. Uh, it just says that they just couldn't dwell together any longer because of their possessions. Uh, God does what Abraham did not do in the very beginning. If you remember, God had asked Abraham to leave his family and his land alone with his wife, and he was going to promise him a great nation. But he didn't obey God. He took a lot with him. And so God does what Abraham could not do. He brings this strife possibly between Lot and Abraham that the land could not support them for their possessions were so great along with the Canaanites and the Parasites. And so they have to literally separate themselves now. This suggests that the solution was not simply a matter of moving a few acres though because you have so many people and tribes around just moving a few acres over wouldn't help. And so they literally have to separate themselves. They have to find new territory. Now, these other people would have had their own flocks to take care of too. A time had arrived when Abraham and Lot had to separate their flocks by distance, if not miles, hundreds of miles. It was a normal custom for an elder like Abraham, a leader, to take the first choice in allowing the younger one the leftovers in a sense. That was just the custom. You always honored and respected the older person. Something that we have <clears throat> neglected in our country. And no longer do. So waving his right, Abram gives the freedom to Lot to choose where he would want to dwell or go to. So the conduct of Abram was really one of peace, of generosity, and not of condescending. He, he wanted really the best for Lot. He learned that when he tries to look out for himself, like in Egypt, he ends up getting in trouble. He ends up messing up. A lesson that I've been trying to learn is stop defending yourself. <laughs> Just let God defend you. <clears throat> when we try to defend ourselves, when we try to watch out for ourselves, you know, even though you know, things happen, accusations and all kinds of stuff, and 
rumors will spread and people will think of you in all kinds of evil ways, which are lies at times. You just have to say, okay, Lord, you know my heart and you know me. And I think Abraham learned a lesson of faith here because of what he went through. And so he wasn't going to defend himself. He wasn't going to look out for himself or his family any longer. He was just going to say, Lot, whatever you want, you just, just go ahead. He's learned to trust in God with his life. And so it seems that that worship at the altar there at Bethel was the right thing for him to do. To get back connected with the Lord, uh, to have that relationship, to know that he is his God and he's directing him, that his God gave him promises and God's going to fulfill his promises because he just saw him even after making a mistake and God bringing him out with all of this wealth. And he said, wow, God, you are faithful. And so I don't need to doubt. I don't need to worry. I even know that if Lot chooses one direction or another, you already know the direction I should go. That's how much faith he had. And so he could easily say, Lot, whatever you want. Paul said, let each of us look out not only for his own interests, but the interests of others. That's the godly thing for us to do, is looking out for the interests of others more than the interests of ourselves. That means sacrifice and surrendering your life for the Lord. I, I think of Nehemiah, you know, he was weeping and crying before the king, putting himself in a very particular situation. Possibly his life could have been taken if the king felt sad for any moment, but the king didn't. God opened up the door and Nehemiah was able to share his heart about the temple and the people and the king supported him and moved him in there and he began to rebuild the temple. But then it all of a sudden gets to a point where he's reestablishing the gates and the walls and, and the Holy of Holies and he's doing the right thing with the right motive and the right heart. And there's people around him mocking him and laughing at him and thinking, what do you think you're doing? And, and in the middle of the night they come and they push the wall down he's got to start all over again. But he's doing the right thing and he gets the people established and they start sacrificing and so forth. But then they're back into the same stuff and he's doing the right thing. And he gets a little carried away and he starts slapping a couple across the face and pulling out some hair from their head and their beards. And, you know, he was reminded, he says, man, what I'm doing to you, you know, pa -pa, is nothing. What you have just been through, your children and your wives and your husbands have died because Babylon came here. And he's trying to remind them of the sorrows and the pains that they suffered. And I slap you around a little bit, you know, hopefully to wake you up and chastise you and correct you. But he was really thinking more highly of others than he was thinking of himself. Uh, it would have been easily to just go back to the king's palace and live there in the comfort of the job that he had, being liked by the king and having favor. But he was looking out for the interests of others. That's what a leadership does. That's what good leadership does. It looked out for others' interests. They, they have these seeker-friendly churches today. It's what they call them, anyway. That's the title of the name that they give these churches because these churches are seeker-friendly in that they, they, they cater to their carnal needs. They cater to the worldly things that are out there, and so they try to bring those things in into the church. And so um, if the church has great music, then they will bring in artists, they will pay for them, and they'll give great music, and they'll play a lot of music and teach very little because people don't want to really hear teaching today. They really don't. People don't want to hear the Word of God anymore. They're tired of hearing the Word of God. You can't even confront anybody with the Word of God anymore. Otherwise, you're in trouble if you try to confront them. Uh, you can have people, you know, hey, you're my pastor. I'm submitted to you. I want you to know that you can confront me anytime because I'm under your authority and I need accountability. And then the first time you do it, I'm out of here. I don't like you. you have, you've got a problem with authority. They don't want to hear it. People don't want to hear the word of God anymore. They just want what itches their ears, as Paul said. They, they want to hear those nice things they want to be able to come to church and and just hear some good music and feel good about it and and hear someone say for about 15 minutes god just loves you he loves you so much 
You know, he's going to bless you. And if you just trust in him, he will bless you and then leave. You can go out for lunch, have a beer, a cup of wine, be with your friends, get a little tipsy after two, three. Hey, you're doing great. And that's what these churches do. All they're doing is ministering to goats. tares because Jesus said there are sheep and goats in the church there's wheats and tares in the church and the goats don't want to eat good food goats don't want to hear the truth tares don't like it and so they go to places where they can hear what they want but good leadership doesn't pay attention to that stuff because good leadership wants to think of people more highly than themselves and preach the truth. Preach the word and nothing but the word. And let that word go out and convict through the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honoring, giving preference to one another. Giving preference to one another. That was Abraham. Abraham's simple faith that God really was on his side allowed him to do what was right. And so he did it. What was Abraham's grief? I mean, you have to wonder if, if Abraham became saddened by the fact, you know, he didn't have any children. So he brings Lot with him. Probably considered Lot to be a son. And maybe even his only son, knowing that he could not have any sons. And so now he finds that his son will be leaving him. And that brought grief to him. But that too you have to trust and have faith in God. Because God will remove your sons. He will take them and move them on. And so he has faith. And Abram meekly lets Lot choose his part of the country look at verse 8 through 13 so Abraham said to Lot please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen for we are brethren it is not the whole land is not the whole land before you please separate from me and if you take the left then I will go to the right and if you go to the right then I will go to the left and Lot lifted his eyes and he saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, of course. Like the garden of the Lord, that is the garden of Eden, it was beautiful. Like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Underline that in your Bible. Who were they exceedingly sinful against? The Lord. Wait a minute. But they're a city and they're just enjoying life they're into sexual immorality they're into homosexuality bestiality uh, child pornography they're into all of that but they're, they're sinning against the Lord they're sinning against the Lord when we sin we don't sin against one another we don't sin against a person or a nation we sin against the Lord that is clear because God has established everything that exists it's his creation and when we sin, we sin against Him. If we give a cup of water to the least of our brethren, it's like giving it to the Lord. But if we don't, then it's like not giving it to the Lord. And so when we sin, we sin against the Lord. Now, Abraham thought that being, the, being brothers was more important than having riches here. And so he told him, go ahead, Lot, please, please, no strife between us, man. We're brothers, man. Bro, man, come on. Whatever you want, you know. What, the whole land is here before you. You choose. Uh, Abram's being the responsible one. He's being unselfish. Take the left. I'll go to the right. You go to the right. I'll go to the left. No problem. I'm going to trust in God. 
And so Lot takes advantage of Abram's grace and he takes the greener land, thinking it's the best thing to do, right? He saw the plains of Jordan that was well watered. Everywhere was like the garden of the Lord, like Egypt's like, wow, yeah, great choice for a worldly man. From a worldly perspective, yeah, who wouldn't choose the best, the richest, the wealthiest, the brightest? Oh, yeah, let me take that. But yet it would be the destruction of Lot. Just because something looks good doesn't mean it's good for you. Just because it looks like it may bless you doesn't mean it's going to be a blessing. More than often, it won't be a blessing. Just because he is handsome and she is beautiful, but yet they're not believers, doesn't mean you should marry them or have a relationship with them. Because Paul is very clear do not be unequally yoked. Because that leads to destruction down the road when you're unequally yoked. Because then you're going, let's go to church. I don't want to go to church. I thought you loved me. I do, but you don't love me. I don't want to go to church. Well, let's raise our children in the church. No, they don't have to go to church. They'll make their own decision. And now you're battling this for the rest of your life. And I know people who have been married for 40 years and one is a believer and the other one is not a believer and their relationship is in shambles because they weren't obedient to the Lord. So he takes advantage of Abram's grace. He sees the best place, but it will lead to his destruction. Lot was, was worldly in his desires, was he not? I mean, it's pretty clear. He's, he's a worldly person. Uh, you can just read it here in his life just like you can see it in someone's life he lifts up his eyes but it's not high enough he didn't lift his eyes to heaven to say lord show me the best place where i should be at and my family no instead he lifted his eyes enough to say wow check that place out now there's where i can make some money there's some possibilities there green pastures wow that is a place to go. Lot saw a good place to raise cattle, but failed to see if it was a good place to raise kids. And it turned out it was not a good place to raise kids, but he was willing to jeopardize their education and livelihood for his own passions and loves and desires. How many have gone in the steps of Lot? How many have gone in his way? It's sad when you see it. And usually when I have to deal with it, it's usually when they've been married for 20, 25 years, and now they're asking me to pray for them because they're in this situation where they're in shambles because they didn't obey the Lord in the beginning. And they know it, but now they're stuck in it. And so now we're just praying for grace. We're praying for God's mercy. We're praying for strength to live in that situation. I mentioned to you that in, in South Sudan that it, not Christians, but South Sudanese who are not Christians can have up to 50 wives, and it all depends on how rich you are. But there's a repercussion. There is a repercussion for having that many wives. If you go to chaplain school after becoming a Christian, and yet you have maybe, let's just say, 10 wives, their thing is you need to have one wife, but you need to take care of the other nine wives. And now that's their responsibility. You can't just say, oh, I'm a Christian now. Uh, I choose you. You're my wife. See you later. And you have all these other children. No, 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 no. Now it's your responsibility to take care of the other nine and your children, but you choose a wife to live with in a relationship. That's the responsibility. There are repercussions to sin. Even if you don't know even if you're not aware and you come to the Lord, there's repercussions. And so they have to support the rest of their wives. That's repercussions, just like we have those. And so we pray for strength. We pray for power. We pray for resources to get through these times when, when we're in those unequally yoked relationships or when we're in the situations that we're in because of bad choices or because we wanted the world more than anything else. 
And it's not always greener on the other side, but Lot will find that the men were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. This reveals that Lot was a man of sight, and as far as Abraham, a man of faith. So you, you see it very clearly there, that picture. Lot lived life by sight and by feelings. Abram desired to live his life by faith and trust in God. <clears throat> How can we live a life of faith and trust in God? We walk every day putting our faith and trust in Him and we don't look at the circumstances around us. It's really that simple. And if the circumstances around us looks dim, then you just focus on the light. If the circumstances around us seem to pressure us in, then you look to the cross and you trust and you have faith in Him. That's how you walk by faith and not by sight. But if you all of a sudden see something that looks better than the cross, you don't go to it. You don't even make the excuse that, well, maybe God is opening up a door. No, when you know it's unscriptural, when you know it's bad for you, you don't do it. You walk by faith. You trust God has something better for you. Better for you. Ministering to a young man just the other day, and, <clears throat> and the young man said, I need prayer. I'm having lust. And he goes, I don't want to get into details, but I have lust and I don't want it. So he's, not, he's trying to walk by faith and not by sight and feelings. He's feeling the lust, but he doesn't want it, so he's walking by faith, and he needs strength to continue to walk by faith and trusting in God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Very clear the scripture is, As Christians, we are to walk by faith, trusting in God every day for our provisions, trusting in God for our very lives and trusting in His directing and guiding and leading us. We are not to go by sight. We're not to even make our own plans. We're to involve the Lord in our plans. A lot of high school kids will be graduating and they'll all be making their little choices on where they want to go. And it's sad because they should be coming to the altar and they should be asking God, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to go? You know, we have, you know, I'll, I'll say it, and I'm not putting anyone on the spot, but we have at least four or five young men who are being discipled right now. <clears throat> the possibilities are endless in what God wants to do. God wouldn't disciple five men for them to just go back into the world and live in the world. God is discipling them for something and some reason. That's why they're being discipled. They're going to get some opportunities here at the church. And I hope they'll take them by faith and not reject them because of sight. God is raising them up to either lead in this church or to start a church or to do something for the Lord. But He doesn't disciple you for nothing. He disciples you for something. You are to walk by faith and not by sight. Sight will scare you. It will discourage you. It will anger you. But faith, you put it all in God and you let Him handle it. A lot, a lot of people are like Lot. <laughs> they sit in the parking lot just like Lot and they do nothing. They say yes to heaven, but they never say no to the world. And like Lot, they end up in a terrible predicament. So Abraham dwells in the land of Canaan there and Lot dwells in the cities of the plains where he pitches his tent. And then we come to verse 14 to 17 as God now renews his commitment to Abraham. Verse 14, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are northward, southward, eastward, westward for all the land which you see I give you and your descendants forever, forever. Underline that forever. It's still Israel's today. All the land of Canaan is Israel's. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if any man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth tree of memory, which means fatness. Love it. 
God gives you the fatness of the lamb, which are in Hebron, which means communion. And so the place where God has you to have communion with him. And he builds an altar there to the Lord. So God shows Abraham his portion. After Lot has separated himself, he looks to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, and God says, all of it is yours forever. He says, I have blessed you beyond what Lot thought he was being blessed with. And, and we know later on the, down the road, Lot's going to lose it all. He's going to lose it all. So God reminds Abraham that his descendants will be 10th to the 25th power. I mean, just innumerable. All the dust, can you, can you count dust? Try counting dust in your hand. That would take a while. I'm sure someone can come up with a, an average, you know, if you have a, a, a square inch, one inch by one inch, and you can count all of that, then you can then multiply it by the distances of the land and come up with some sort of number, which I think would be 10 to the 50th power, which is un, you know, way beyond what we could ever think. But he says, I'm going to make your descendants like the dust of the earth, that no man could number them at all. So Abraham is told, take a walk. And look at your land. Move his tent. And he dwelt there in Hebron. And he built another altar. You can almost call Abraham an altar builder, right? He loved to build altars. He loved to worship the Lord. Uh, to have communion with God. Because God always gave him the fatness of the land. Building altars. <clears throat> Today we don't build altars. Today we worship at the altar. We praise God and we give Him thanksgiving for what He has done in our lives. Uh, we worship the Lord at an altar in a sense. And I'm wondering if Abram possibly prayed for Lot too because he was sad knowing that Lot had chosen the lesser of God's blessings. And so he may have prayed for him at this new altar where his tears and his sacrifices were laid upon just a few things that I think we can draw out from this. You know, if we fail, and let me say this, you will fail. <laughs> you will fail. But we still love you. You're still loved by God. And you can go right to Him and <coughs> repent. Confess your sins because He's faithful and just to forgive you. Go right to the altar. Jesus has made the provision of forgiveness by His blood. It's done already. All we have to do is take hold of it. And as far as the east is from the west, he remembers your sin no more. It's gone. It's forgotten. And you can move on fresh and anew just like it's a new day with no sins whatsoever. Second, Abram was willing to think of Lot first, knowing that God would bless him because he put his faith and trust in him. Think of others more highly than you think of yourselves. God would bring him down to the promised land and let him pitch his tent and enjoy the fatness of the land. You know, we do have choices. We really do. And we need to choose wisely. Not like Lot, because it looks like the right place, looks like enough money. But choose wisely under God's guidance and wisdom knowing that God would lead us. Are you known as a worshiper? Do you truly worship the Lord? If someone were to see you in your vehicle driving down the 91 freeway at about 30 miles an hour because it doesn't go any faster than that on the 91, would they see you raising your hands and worshiping the Lord on the radio? Yeah. Would they see you doing that? So Alexander White said this, the Christian life is basically a series of new beginnings. How true is that? We stumble, we fall, but the Lord's grace is sufficient. His mercy is matchless. He reaches down to you and to me, and he, puts, he pulls us up onto our feet, just like he did with Abraham. That is the Christian walk. From the day that I got saved to this very day, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've fallen, how many times I've struggled, how many times, but God has always just as many times has always brought me back up and always forgiven me. He does that for all of us. We're the church. That's what he does for the church. And it's not condemning, it's restoring and it's correcting 
so that we can continue on with what God wants us to do in his work. Abram was a man of faith, but he was also a man of humility. He was willing to repent and turn from his ways and continue to seek the Lord. Let's be like Abram.